Well, let's take our Bibles and uh, turn to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Keep your Bible open at verses 1 through 8. And because of time, we're just going to get straight into the text. I want to speak this morning on the subject, highly gifted people. Highly gifted people. Romans 12, 1 to 8. It's part of our series, Total Grace. I think you'd agree with me that God's grace is amazing, isn't it? There's nothing quite like it. Nothing matches the idea that God unprompted has favored us in an undeserved manner. While we were yet sinners, God commended His love toward us in the giving of His Son. By God's grace, we have been given what we don't deserve, forgiveness, justification, adoption into God's family, the gift of God Himself through the indwelling Holy Spirit, the promise of heaven, on and on and on it goes. The gift of Jesus Christ is the gift that keeps on giving. Grace is amazing. It's not not only amazing in what it gives, it's amazing in what it withholds in terms of mercy. We're not given what we deserve. God doesn't reward us a according to our iniquities. We don't get hell. We don't get judgment. God doesn't withdraw His common grace to any one of us. God is good. And God does good. And as a friend of mine said, Pete Mother said to me many years ago, Philip, there will be nothing greater come into your life than the grace of God unless you allow that to happen. It's true. Grace is amazing. John Newton is right. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And he should know what he's speaking about, given the fact he was once a slave trader working the coast of Africa until God saved him and made him a wonderful minister in the Church of England. Amazing grace. Grace is amazing. But here's the point we're trying to get to in our present series, Total Grace. Grace is not only amazing, it's abundant. It's not only wonderful, it is full. Because in John 1, 16, we read that out of His fullness, Jesus Christ has given to us grace upon grace. If you want to understand the image of that tax, go down to the Newport Beach Pier and just watch wave after wave hit the shore. And understand that's a picture of The ocean of God's grace that just keeps touching the shoreline of our lives. One grace after another grace in the place of grace. Beautiful picture. And it reminds us that grace is not something that just meets us on the front end of the Christian life. Grace establishes us in the Christian life, excites us, energizes us, and enables us throughout the totality of our Christian experience. In fact, having quoted John 1, 16, I've got to quote 2 Corinthians 9, verse 8. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 8. Listen to these words, one of my favorite verses in the Bible. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. That, That text is so enormous. That promise is so extensive. You literally can build your entire life on 2 Corinthians 9, verse 8. See, if you go back to the writing of the New Testament, in the Greek, exclamation marks weren't available. And so the way they underlined something, the way they emphasized something was to repeat the word. For emphasis, that's how they... That was kind of their exclamation mark. And that's what we have here, an exclamation of the sufficiency of God's grace. Look at that word all or or something like it in the text. God is able to make all grace abound to you, always having all sufficiency in all things at all times for every good work. I mean, that that is such a large blanket. You can throw it over all of life. All things at all times are met by God's all-sufficient grace. So grace isn't just amazing, it's abundant. Grace establishes justification. 
Grace fuels sanctification. Grace promises glorification. It's grace all the way, folks. Total grace all the way. That's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 9 and 10, I am what I am by the grace of God. Philip Graham Ryken said it well. Grace is not just the way into the Christian life. It is the way on in the Christian life. And that's why we've been looking at this subject and holding up this gem and seeing its different facets and understanding how beautiful and varied the grace of God is. We've looked at saving grace, strengthening grace, speaking grace. And this morning from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 8, we're looking at serving grace. Do you realize that God gives us grace to serve Him? God gives us capacities to help the church grow and impact the world. Uh, go back to our text. Keep your Bible open. Romans 12. Look at verse 6. This is where I get my idea of serving grace. Having then gifts or enablements or capacities, whatever way you want to describe that, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. Spiritual gifts are grace gifts. Charismata, spiritual gifts, are enablements that God has favored us with for the purpose of edifying the church and evangelizing the world. That's where I get my message this morning, highly gifted people. Every one of you is a highly gifted person. You're a spiritual prodigy. You're a talented child. Because by the grace of God, you have been given gifts that you should employ and deploy for the good of the church. So let's come to this text. Um, uh, j just notice, will you, the word therefore in verse 1, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Just putting the text in its context, I want you to notice, if you don't already know this, that that is indicating we are transitioning. It's a turning point. It's a pivotal point in this book. We're moving from verse chapters 1 through 11, which are doctrinal, to chapters 12 through 16, which are ethical. In chapters 1 through 11, the gospel in its content is explained. In, in chapters 11 through 12 through 16, the gospel in its impact is applied. You have gospel indicatives in chapters 1 through 11, gospel imperatives chapter 12 through 16. An indicative is a statement of fact. So in chapters 1 through 11, Paul makes statements about justification and sanctification and glorification and the promise of glory beyond this life and the intercession of Jesus Christ for his people and the gift of the Holy Spirit. He makes indicative statements about the gospel, but having made those, he now makes imperative statements in the light of the gospel. Here's what you ought to be. Here's what you ought to do. And in this context, he says, you need to present your body to Christ. You need to submit your life to his lordship. And one of the ways that will work itself out is by the employment of your spiritual gifts to the body of Christ. So give your body to Christ, and then Christ will use you in the body of Christ to grow it. Amen? So three things, the argument, the assessment, the assignment. Time's fleeting this morning. Verses 1 to 2, the argument. Verse 3, the assessment. Verses 4 through 8, the assignment. What's the argument? Well, this is verses 1 to 2. Just going to kind of touch on this because they, they, they kind of act as a bridge between the theological and the ethical. We move from doctrine to duty, but they also form a prelude to Paul's instruction on spiritual gifts. See, before you serve the body of Christ, you need to present your body to Christ. If you're going to serve the kingdom you need to become a bona fide servant. You need to present your body as a living sacrifice to Jesus Christ. So that's the argument. And drawing from Old Testament liturgy and life, Paul uses Levitical language to challenge the new covenant believer to give their lives to God like the Levitical priest would sacrifice an animal on the altar. 
in the tabernacle or the temple. In fact, when you get into the language of this text, it's very Levitical. The word present there is the same word that's used in the Greek Old Testament of priests presenting offerings to God. Then remember, the church is now the temple. So that's, it's language that fits. Now that you're the temple, what do you offer? Do we offer dead animals? No. We offer ourselves upon the altar of dedication. We present ourselves. The word body certainly includes the body, but it's bigger than that. It's all encompassing body, mind, and soul. Head to foot, give yourself to God. That's the word present. And as I've already alluded to, the, the offering is not a dead animal. It is a living, breathing human being that willfully, voluntarily places themselves on the altar of service and worship of God. It's been well said, hasn't it, that living sacrifices can crawl off the altar. And that's the challenge. You know, a dead animal just lay there. But you and I are people with desires and wills and aspirations. And in the light of the gospel, we have to bring all those aspirations, all those uh, um, thoughts about how we ought to live our lives to the foot of the cross. And we've got to bring it under the lordship of Jesus Christ so that we stay on the altar and day in and day out give ourselves to gospel ministry. And in fact, if you notice the word service, verse 1 again, which is your reasonable service. Some of your translations might have that worship because it's a liturgical word. It comes right out again of Levitical life. This is your worship. In an act of worship, give yourself to Jesus Christ, head to foot, morning to evening, Monday to Sunday. That's the challenge here. That's what's being laid before us. Before you serve the body of Christ, give your body to Christ in an act of service. And those two things go together, and the one precedes the other. And the argument is this. You need to do that. You, you need to prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. And, and, and you do that because of what? The mercies of God. I urge you, I beseech you, I call on you, brothers, by, in the light of the mercies of God, offer your life to Jesus Christ. That's the argument. It's my first thought, the argument. I want you to notice that's plural. Some will make an argument. It, 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 it may be just the immediate context of Romans 9 to 11 where the word mercy appears several times in terms of God's uh, uh, love for both Israel and the Gentile world. But, I, you know, I think most commentators would agree that it at least stretches back beyond that. Chapters 1 through 11, the mercies of God, the gospel, the grace of God, justification, the gift of imputed righteousness. Um, ra reconciliation is one of the themes earlier in Romans, where, where what Jesus Christ did was, was made, make peace between us and God through a propitiatory act on the cross. The word propitiation is used in Romans, speaks of satisfaction, how Jesus in his death satisfied the just and holy demands of God. It's all the gospel. It's all mercy. And with Jesus Christ, you're given the gift of the Holy Spirit, Romans 8. It brings security. You're reminded of your adoption into God's family. You've got Jesus Christ who's praying for you, the Spirit of God who's interpreting your prayers. When you don't know what to pray for, you've got the promise of shared glory, the glory that awaits us at the redemption of the children of God. It's all mercy. And, it, and he just piles argument upon argument and layer upon layer of understanding regarding the gospel. And Paul says, okay, in the light of the gospel, in the light of the mercies of God, justification, sanctification, glorification, propitiation, reconciliation, adoption, is there anything else you can do but present your body? I, I love what Paul says. Look at your Bible. Now, the New King James translates it, this is your reasonable service. It's a good translation. You, you might have a translation, this is your spiritual worship. 
but reasonable service is a better translation. The Greek word translated here, reasonable, is the word that gives us the English term logic. In fact, you could literally translate this, present your body as a living sacrifice in an act of service because it's the only logical thing you can do. In the light of the mercy of God, in the light of uh, His sacrifice in Jesus Christ, wouldn't you give yourself to Him? Wouldn't it be unreasonable to do anything else? Would it make sense for you to withhold your heart, your mind, and your soul, and your days? No. The only sensible thing to do with your life is surrender it in Christian service for ministry and missions at home and abroad. Love that. That's the argument. And it's going to be, it's going to predicate the whole argument on spiritual gifts. As you give yourself to serving the church through the gifts that God has given you, that's simply the outworking of the whole idea that you've already given yourself to Christ in an act of spiritual worship, in an act of logical service. Wasn't it C.T. Studd who said, if Jesus Christ be God and died for me, then there is no sacrifice too great for me to make for him? This was a man who was a blue blood, inherited a vast sum of money. He was a famous cricketer in England in his day, equivalent to like a high, highly paid MLB player. But he, 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 he left it all at the foot of the cross. And with his wife, he went to China. And over a lifetime, he gave every single penny of his inheritance away and invested it in missions. And you say, how did he do that? What motivated him? It was the logic of the fact, if Jesus Christ is God and came in human form and died on a cross for me, that I might know eternal life and glory forever, then is there something too big that I shouldn't give up for him? Of course not. That would be illogical. In the light of what he has given, the only reasonable thing I can do is sing, I surrender all. Or sing and mean it, take my life and let it be dedicated, Lord, to thee. That's the argument. Secondly, the assessment. The assessment, this is verse 3. Through the grace of God given to Paul, he now challenges them not to think of themselves more highly than they ought, but to think soberly, measured, proportionately, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. See, he's talked about a renewed mind in verse 2, and he wants them to take that renewed mind now informed by the gospel. He wants them to spend some time in self-reflection, in personal assessment, so that indeed they might determine what gift, what capacity, what role has God given them to play in the body, which he will now speak about in verses 4 through 8. Here's the point of the text. Given the fact that each believer has been graced or mercied by God, and along with the gift of eternal life, they have been given the gift of the Holy Spirit, and along with the gift of the Holy Spirit, they have been given gifts of the Holy Spirit, they are to soberly, proportionally, and measuredly decide what is their contribution to be in the church. What is their part? Are they a hand? Are they a foot? Are they an arm? Are they a leg? What, what part of the body of Christ are they? What role, function do they have? Now, here's a point I don't want you to miss. Given that Paul is encouraging them to soberly judge their giftedness. You and I need to conclude that it is not wrong to know or even express what you're good at because you're good at something. In the life of the church, God has gifted you to be good at something. A spiritual gift is a capacity to help grow the body to edify the body, it's a capacity in which you will excel. 
It's, a, it's another gear. Because when we read about the gifts of teaching or leading or mercy or giving, remember the implication isn't, well, I don't have the gift of giving, so I don't have to give. It's not what the text is teaching. The boxes are on the doors on the way out. And, and, and well, I don't have the gift of mercy, so I can be nasty. No, 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 no. You're going to be merciful as a Christian. You're going to teach the Word of God. You're going to give to the Lord's work. But if you've got a gift in this area, a capacity, an endowment of the Spirit, you're going to have another gear in those areas. You're going to excel at teaching. You're going to excel at giving. You're going to excel at mercy. That's the point. And there's nothing wrong to determine that's your gift. Now, what is wrong is to overestimate your gift or underestimate your gift. That, that is what's wrong. Not to have a confidence about your giftedness. You know, not to, you know, deflect. Well, you know what? You do that really well. Oh, oh not me, not me. You know? But no, let's not overestimate. Let's not underestimate. What does Paul say? Don't think too highly of yourself. So if you do excel in an area, give God the glory. You can be confident about your gift in this, but don't boast in it. Don't belittle other people's gifts. Don't, don't use it as a platform for self-promotion. No, don't be thinking too highly. Don't allow that to take you to a place of pride. But on the other hand, he says, don't underestimate. Because to each one has been given a measure of faith. We all have a gift in this, a measure of faith. God's got something for each of us to do. This is false humility. And it's just as bad as pride, by the way, you know. Oh, pastor, I, I'm just no good at anything. Uh, you know, I, I, I just, you know, I look at sister such and such and brother so and so and wow, I could never be that. You don't be a spiritual Eeyore, okay? <laughs> That's nothing. The Bible says don't do that. Don't, don't think too highly of yourself. On the other hand, don't deny to each one has been given a measure of faith. So here's the point as we move on. We need to be our best selves in Christ. That's what Paul's calling us to. Be your best self. Be comfortable in your own skin. Be happy to embrace how God has made you and how God has gifted you. Don't, know, don't, don't covet another man's gifts. Discover your own giftedness. Embrace your own capacity. Develop that to a place of excellence where others will recognize that, may even thank you about that, embrace that, but don't let that become a, play, um, a, a, you know, a, a thing of pride. Don't deny it, because then you're robbing God of His glory because God is putting His grace on display in your life. No, become comfortable with who you are. You have natural gifts. You realize that? When you were born, God gave you capacities. What, wasn't it Eric Little? Who, had, who had an athletic ability. And if you read his story or watch the movie Chariots of Fire, he said to his sister, God made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. We've got natural abilities. We should embrace them and develop them. We get those at birth. Some of us are good at construction. Some of us are good at art. Some of us are good at tack. Some of us are good at cooking. I mean, it on and on it goes. Embrace that. We all benefit from you being good at something. You enrich society. You bless your family. And then at new birth, you get spiritual gifts, grace gifts, charismata, which Paul's talking about here. Some of it's prophecy, teaching, exhortation, giving, leading, mercy. You need to realize that you are highly gifted. You are a spiritual prodigy. You are a talented child, both naturally and supernaturally. I like the bumper sticker that said, be yourself, everyone else is taken. <laughs> and it's a good word, and that's what Paul is saying here. In, in many ways, be yourself. Everyone else is taken. 
God made you. I, some, someone said, I don't know where I stole this from, every child born is a brand new idea from the mind of God. That's a beautiful statement. That child is unique with unique gifts and contributions to make society and God's grace to the church through salvation. That's the analogy of the body, isn't it? We're, 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 we're individual members. We belong to one another and we're one body in Christ. So don't be a spiritual copycat. Don't, don't try and be someone else. Be yourself. Everyone else is taken. God's got a specific role for you. Remember that your effectiveness must accompany desire. Whatever you desire to do for God, it must be accompanied by effectiveness. That's spiritual gifting. You might desire to do something, but if you're not effective at it, don't do it. In, in any, you know, real continual basis, as I've said, we can all serve in all kinds of areas, but you want to find a place where you're most effective. Concentrate on your giftedness. Discover it and develop it. Become the best you can be for Christ with what you have and what God has called you to be. Look, every tennis racket has a sweet spot. Now, I, tennis rackets I had, never find, I never find the sweet spot. <laughs> but they tell me every tennis racket has a sweet spot. In fact, I think they're nigh almost marked, you know, with certain coloring. Every golf club has a sweet spot. Every baseball bat has a sweet spot. What's a sweet spot? Well, a sweet spot is the place engineered by engineers to cause the ball to go kapow. If you can get that tennis ball in the middle of that racket, kapow. You can bring that club head down at the right speed. You get that ball on the sweet spot, kapow. And you know what? God has engineered you and me, and we have a zone, we have a sweet spot, we have a capacity that Paul talks about here that allows our life to go kapow. And it's important that we embrace it. Brings us to the assignment. The assignment. Embedded in the gift of God's grace in Christ are grace gifts. As we've said, when we receive the gift of eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ, we are given the gift of the Holy Spirit. And according to 1 Peter 4, Ephesians 4, 1 Corinthians 12, and Romans 12, we are given gifts of the Holy Spirit. Charismata enablements, capacities to function in the body in an effective, excellent manner where, where we contribute significantly to the life of the church. And everybody's got a grace gift. You may have more than one grace gift. Now remember, just because you don't have the grace gift in a particular area it doesn't mean you don't teach, you don't give, you don't mercy people. But Beyond the general, there's going to be a particular area that you will excel at. And you and I need to embrace that, and, and we need to develop that, because we've all got it. Listen, it's, it's implied here, isn't it? I mean, Paul's speaking to the whole body, and he's saying it, we're all individual members, and each member's got a gift differing according to grace, and we ought to use each of our gifts to bless the body. If you wanted another verse on this, it would be 1 Corinthians 12, verse 11, where Paul says these words, but one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing, speaking about God's grace gifts, to each one individually as he wills. 1 Peter 4, verse 10 talks about that too. We have been given these gifts to edify the body, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 12. That's the assignment. You've been given an assignment. And that assignment is dictated by your spiritual gifting, your capacity. And you've got it. Now, may, you may not yet have discovered it, but you need to discover it. You need to have a confidence about your giftedness. Don't be embarrassed to embrace that. Don't get proud, but don't show some false humility. You've got a giftedness. You've got a contribution to make here. And it's along with Friends, in trial and error, through experience, through ministry, through, spirit, through godly leadership, you can discover what that gift is. And according to Ephesians 4, church leadership can equip you then on to every good work. 
For the time that's left, and time's almost gone, I've got three things that come out of this, what I call forceful unity, fruitful diversity, faithful mutuality. If you look at these verses 4 through 8, you'll see a theme of unity, a theme of diversity, and a theme of mutuality. We'll just kind of hop, skip, and jump quickly across them. Just notice the theme of unity. Paul says, doesn't he, in verse 4, that we are members in one body. Speaking about the church, that the church is often, you know, pictured as a body. Like, just like a body, it's all got various members and that have got different functions, but they all belong together. I mean, the arm doesn't operate by itself. The foot doesn't operate by itself. It, it, it's all one body in Christ, verse 5, and there's a forceful unity here. There's, there's an emphasis on unity. There's just this thought that you and I are part of the church. If you haven't discovered this yet, we'll help you to embrace it. The Christian life is church life. When you and I united ourselves to Christ, we were simultaneously united to everyone else who's united to Christ. And that's why throughout the world on a given Sunday, groups of Christians unite in church life because that's the Christian way to the saints at Philippi, to the saints at Rome, to the saints at Corinth. Life is lived in the company of God's saints, not just on the Lord's Day, but throughout the week in small groups, visiting each other, delivering meals, going to hospitals, whatever the case might be. There is a unity here that Paul doesn't want us to miss. Psalm 133, it is a beautiful and a pleasant thing when God's people dwell together in unity, where they recognize they belong. You and I may have come to Christ separately, and you and I may have placed our faith in Christ individually. But while our faith is personal, it is not private. It is not isolated. We were baptized by one spirit in the one body the moment we got saved. That's why I got saved on a Sunday night. And by the next Sunday, I find a place to go and worship with God's people. It was just intuitive. It was just a knowledge. You know what? I'm one of the Christians now. Where do the Christians meet? Because I need to hang out with God's people. I'm done with the devil's crowd. I'm done with the world. Where's God's people meeting? Where's the gathering of the church, the body, the family? And that means that we are to act as one. You've got to have this mentality. You've got to think church. You've got to think body. You've got to think unity. You've got to think, I I act not alone, but in concert with God's people. Because... A body that's acting as a unit coordinated is a beautiful thing to behold, isn't it? Have you ever watched a ballerina or a dancer? It's just a beautiful thing to behold. The the body, every muscle, every part of the body working in unison, coordinated. That's the picture. Paul says we're one and we ought to act that way. We ought, we ought to em- embrace that thought of, of communal corporate life. I mean, not only the, the, the dancer, maybe even just think about the, the simple act of eating, which we take for granted three times a day. Some of you five or six times a day, <laughs> myself included. But, but a simple act. My hand takes the food. My mouth eats the food. And my stomach digests the food. I mean, that's coordination. That's unity. When, when unity works. It, it produces. You've not only got forceful unity, you've got fruitful diversity. Now, there's one body, but each body's made up of many parts. Can't help but notice that, okay? You know, we've got two hands, two feet, two arms, two legs, two lungs, one heart, one mind, set of teeth. Two nostrils, two ears, well, all kinds of members, some hidden and some very public. And they've all got a particular role. There's no part that's useless. That's Paul's point. Now, we're one body, that's unity, but we're a diverse body with many parts that make up the whole, and each part is significant, and each part is special. 
And that's why we shouldn't envy each other. That's why we should compliment each other. That's why we should be grateful for one another because someone can do what I can't, which allows me to do what I need to be doing, and together we get stuff done. That's the point Paul's making here, right? Having gifts then differing according to the grace that is given to us. Let's use them. If you've got this diversity, now we don't have time to, you know, do a deep dive into this, but there are seven gifts that Paul outlines, seven of possibly 19 gifts identified in the New Testament from 1 Corinthians 12 to 1 Peter 4, Ephesians 4, Romans 12. They usually break down into three categories, sign gifts, serving gifts, and speaking gifts. It's the conviction of this church that the sign gifts are the, the, the gifts of the apostles like healings and words of prophecy, uh, uh, um, things that accompanied uh, the apostolic era are, are no longer normative for this age, but there are still speaking gifts and serving gifts. And, and Paul outlines seven of them. I don't have time to, as I say, deep dive, but one's prophecy. In its classic sense, prophecy, both Old and New Testament, was a revelation received from God directly that foretold some future event. But if you read the story of the prophets, Old and New Testament, you'll also find that they sometimes repeated what had already been prophesied. So there was a retelling of what had already been revealed. And so prophecy is not only foretelling the future, it is foretelling what has already been given. And in that sense, an element of prophesying is preaching. The prophets often preached what had been already given through prophecy. Now, I believe the prophets have gone. According to Ephesians 2, they're in the foundation of the church. But preachers can speak prophesying the word already given. And in that sense, there's an element of this that's still in operation day. But in its classic sense, I believe this gift is gone. Teaching or sorry, ministering, that's the gift of service. It's the word we get our word deacon from, and in some sense it might speak of the office of a deacon who serves selflessly the body, its needs. But I think generally it just means serving one another, helping one another, being there for one another. And people have that gift. We all serve, but some people are just super servants. I mean, they're tireless in it. They love it. They excel in it. You, you've got teaching. It's teaching God's Word. Does that differ from prophesying? In the sense that I think generally prophets or prophesying go for the heart and the mind or the heart and the will, where teaching goes for the mind, it informs. It, it's someone who takes the Word of God already revealed and studies it deeply and, and then communicates it clearly so that the people of God know what the will of God is for their lives. Exhortation. This is a word that means to come alongside, to exhort, to cheerlead. It's a great word. It, it's, it's the gift of just, you know, helping someone get off the floor, helping someone take the, the, another step when, they, you know, they, they just feel like lying down and rolling over. It, it's literally to come alongside. It's the, it's the picture of a parent running alongside their child who's kind of learning to ride a bicycle. And you're holding them up under their solid. You're keeping them straight, keeping them moving forward. They're shouting and screaming, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. And you're going, no, you're not. And then you just send them down the hill <laughs> and see what happens. Well, it's kind of, that's our word. You run alongside and you encourage. No, you can do this. Come on, you can do this. Show some courage here. Go the second mile. That's our word. Some people excel in that. Giving? Well, we all give. And, and in, in its true sense, giving isn't even a matter of wealth. But I think generally speaking, this is the idea that there are those who excel in giving to whom much is being given, much will be required. And so people who are blessed materially are often gifted by God to give that away with liberality. And that's a gift where they love to give. The, the, the Philippians give out of their poverty liberally. 
But generally speaking, this is someone who has been blessed and realized they're a steward of God's blessing, and they give with, with, with liberality. Um, I, I have a friend whom God has blessed immeasurably, retired at 45. I remember hearing the story of how that all came about. And I think over dinner I asked uh, both this man and his wife, well, what have you been doing since your retirement? To which she replied, he's been spending the rest of his time giving it all away. And I thought to myself, maybe I can help him. <laughs> and talked about KTT. You get the point. That's, that's the gift of giving, liberality. Leading, it's probably a kissing cousin of administration. It speaks of pastors, leaders, those who set a direction and come up with a strategy, and then mercy. Well, as we've said, we've all got to be merciful. Blessed are the merciful. But this is, these are, you know these people. I, I've got them. I actually think my youngest daughter's got this gift. It's a gift of mercy. It's, it's just big heartedness. You know, helping people who are hurting and difficult in difficult circumstances. I, I can jump in there. I don't excel in there. I get exhausted in there. Some people just have such a heart and a soul that's being graced and mercyed by God. It's a gift. It's a blessing, isn't it, to the body? These are the gifts. There's unity, there's diversity. Finally, and we're a little over time, we'll, we'll uh, you know, wrap up just maybe with a verse of our song. Mutuality. Go back to verse 5. Verse 5. I want you to see something you saw but didn't see. We being many are one body and individually members of one another. Literally, NLT translates that like this. We belong to each other and each of us needs all the others. We belong to each other. I want you to look around this morning and remind yourself that you owe people in this room something. You belong to them. As, as John Murray, the great Reformed commentator in Romans said, you have property in their lives. The gift that God has given them, he gave them a gift for you because all gifts are for the edification of the body. Think about that. The gift that God gave them, he gave that to them for you. So you have property in their life. And if they don't give you it, in a very real sense, they're cheating you and they're robbing you. Christians that don't serve the church are robbing the church. Christians that don't actively help the body are cheating the body of Christ. And in, 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 by inference, the world, because the body of Christ exists to bless the lost. And so Paul is reminding us unity, diversity, mutuality. The hand can't say to the foot, I don't need you. The hand can't say, I'm taking a break because the foot needs the hand. Same with the foot. That's Paul's argument, isn't it, in 1 Corinthians 12? The Christian faith is not a solo. It's a duet. It's a team sport. We need each other. You have a right to my giftedness, and I have a right to your giftedness. And when we're fully functioning, we're going to do some things for Christ. That's what's being taught here. None of us are a one-man band. None of us are the complete package. In fact, Paul says to the Romans in chapter 1, verse 11, 12, I want to come and share a gift with you. I want to make up for what's lacking. I want to minister to you. That, that, that's the point. I want you to be challenged by that. I want you to be challenged by that. When you come onto this property, realize you owe. You owe every believer in this building this morning something. You owe them your giftedness. 
your capacity, your ability that the Spirit of God has gifted you with uniquely. You're a part of the body, and you better be a functioning part of the body, or else we will be a disabled church. Able to do some things. People with disabilities are able to do many things, but not all things. Because they're not able-bodied in that fullest sense. Same analogy with the church. You have dysfunctional churches and churches that are hampered and disabled because of non-functioning members who are highly gifted people. (laughs) Let's not be that. Let's join together. Let's pull our resources. Let's um, do what God has called and gifted us to do so that we can do more and be a blessing to many. Father, we thank you for our time in the Word. We've kind of run through Romans 12 when we would love to have walked through it. Thank you for the challenge of the reasonableness of surrendering our life to Jesus Christ. Thank you for the reminder to take a look at ourselves and determine what we're good at. Not to become proud about it, nor to deny it with a false humility. Because you have gifted each one of us so that in working in unison with other Christians, pulling the diversity of our gifts recognizing our obligation to one another. Kindred Community Church might be a wonderful expression of the body of Christ because we realize that today we are His hands and we are His feet in the world. And we pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've got someone in our children's...